We have uh, Ben Ons followed by an unknown conference this morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Marvin Saber, uh, Margaret Fisher Medical School uh, training at Tulane, followed by her residency here in our department at UW. Seth Stanford for a year of fellowship in endurance team here, followed by a year of Clinical instructor, and then following her clinical instructor year, we were able to recruit her to stay on uh, here at UW, and she's an assistant professor in our department. Uh, pleasure to introduce her to teach us a little bit about the lasers in endourology. So, without further ado, Dr. Knadler. <laughs> okay. Hello. Can everyone hear me? All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present today. So, um, uh, as Dr. Williams said, I'm going to talk about lasers today. Um, here are my disclosures, maybe. Um, so, when my kids ask me what I do at work all day, I tell them I fight bad guy kidney stones with lasers. Um, but in reality, we do wield a lot of power when we use lasers. Um, the laser can be an elegant tool in the right hands, but if used incorrectly, we can also cause a lot of harm. So today I'm going to go over the basic concepts of how the laser works and the recent advances in laser technology that have gotten us to where we are today. Um, I'm also going to discuss how to maximize the laser to, the mo to most efficiently and effectively treat nephrolithiasis while preventing unintended damage from the laser. Um, there are a lot of laser machines available on the market, but there are really only two types of lasers, the holmium and the solium laser. So the holmium has been used to treat kidney stones since the 1990s and is the gold standard for treating stones. Uh, the recent advance in holmium laser technology has been MOSES technology, and we'll discuss this more in detail later. The second type of laser is the thulium fiber laser. Um, thulium and holmium are distinct chemical elements and thus have different, different properties. Um, thulium is an exciting new technology, and there are a lot of theoretical benefits, um, but there is limited clinical data at this point. And as a field, we are still discovering how to best use the thulium fiber laser. So let's talk about the basics of how the laser is generated. So for our purposes as urologists, uh, this is the basic schematic of the holmium laser. It's an optical cavity with a solid state crystal. So pretty much there is a light bulb or flash lamp that emits light and excites the holmium ions on the YAG crystal. This emits new photons, and these photons bounce off the mirrors in the cavity um, and are directed towards the exit, where they are um, concentrated in pulses emitted into the laser fiber. Each of these setups is limited to 30 watts of power. So our original lasers were 30 watt lasers. We now have the ability to have high powered lasers up to 120 watts, and this is achieved by having multiple cavities in parallel that are all working together to, um, to emit photons into the laser. Um, so the trade offs for these high power lasers are that they're more delicate machines, they're more lasers that can get misaligned if the um, if the machine is. Um, moved around a lot. You also need a cooling system. So this cooling system is bulky, loud, and increases the net energy used. So to recap, the Holmium laser is a flash lamp laser. It's a delicate machine, but can produce high power pulses up to 120 watts. So MOSES technology is a two pulse setting that can be applied to the Holmium laser. The two pulses are released in a short success, succession in which the first pulse creates a small vapor bubble, allowing the second pulse to hit the stone unobstructed. Um, this allows for maximal energy delivery to the stone. 
The goal of MOSES technology is to improve laser efficiency and decrease retropulsion for less movement of the stone while lasing. We'll go over some of the clinical data on this a little later. The thulium fiber laser is not a flash lamp laser, but a diode laser. So instead of using a crystal doped with homium ions, there's a silica fiber doped with thulium ions and diode lasers pump energy into the fiber. The fiber emits wavelengths of 1940 nanometers. And since the emission spectrum of the diode laser matches the thulium ion absorption line, less energy is dissipated in heat. So it isn't important to know all the details of how the lasers work, but just that there are a few key differences between the two. So interestingly, there are probably multiple mechanisms by which the lasers break up stones. Uh, one of the potential mechanisms is that the laser excites microscopic amounts of water embedded within the crystalline matrix of the stone. Uh, this excitation um, of these tiny pockets contributes to stone fracturing. Both the holmium and the thulium lasers have excellent absorption in water, which fits with this theory. A di an additional benefit of the thulium laser is that the energy of the laser is dissipated after a very short distance, and so less penetration to the surrounding tissues. Um, another benefit of the thulium is that it's smaller and quieter. It does not require the bulky cooling system that the holomian laser does. Also has a normal electrical cord, um, while the holomian requires a specialized outlet, so it can only be used in certain operating rooms that have that outlet. So we just went over um, the laser technology. Now let's talk about how to get the most out of your laser. It's always important to go back to the guidelines, but here they don't help us that much. So AUA guidelines have no guidelines on lasers. They do mention that you should not use EHL as the first line modality for interureteral lithotripsy. EAU actually does have a guideline saying that you should use holmium as the first line for your ureteroscopy, um, but they don't give you much guidance beyond this. Part of this is because the AUA guidelines haven't been updated since 2016. And part of it is there's a lot of variability in practice, um, but not a lot of strong clinical evidence saying that one is better than the other. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today, um, the recommendations I have are based on clinical experience. So this is what you can control as the urologist. Um, the machine type that you're using, maybe, um, a lot of times is dictated by what your institution has. Um, the laser settings, and then also the technique that you use. So the settings include the pulse energy in joules, the pulse frequency in hertz, and then the high power lasers, you also have control over the pulse width. And then I do wanna highlight that even though you're individually adjusting these settings, um, you should also pay attention to the overall power, which is in watts. So the energy times the frequency equals power. And that is kind of um, uh, one of the more important things for how fast you're treating the stone and also the potential damage that you can do to the surrounding tissues. So first generation holmium lasers only had a short pulse width, about 350 microseconds, while newer systems can go up to 1500. The longer pulse width leads to less retropulsion, so less time chasing after the stone, but also delivers less energy with each pulse. The thulium laser fi fiber laser has an even wider range of pulse widths. Um, with extremely long pulse widths up to 12,000. This isn't as applicable in stone disease, but can um, be beneficial when you're looking at soft tissue ablation. So how do we put this all together? You can combine these settings to optimize your technique. Technique use is often based on surgeon preference, 
but other considerations, including stone composition, location, and size of the stone are important as well. Many people like to fragment stones and basket extract them, while others like to dust the stone into small particles that'll pass on their own. Popcorning is a combination of the two and involves sitting at the entrance of the calyx and using the laser at a distance to break up the stone. So you may notice as I go through these that I'm using the holmium laser settings. Uh, these settings can be used for holmium or thulium, but I'll also go through a few um, considerations that differ when using the thulium laser instead. So the goal of fragmentation is to break up the stone into pieces that can be basket extracted. Um, to do this most efficiently, you wanna use a high energy and a low frequency. Uh, and you want the most energy with each pulse to break up the stone. So a short pulse duration is also important. Um, these are my starting settings, but I will adjust the settings as needed throughout the case, depending on how well the stone is breaking up. So dusting is a great way to treat stones. It's efficient and does not require time consuming extraction of stone fragments. Dusting involves generating smaller particles that will pass on their own. There's no consensus on the definition of what dusting is, but most endourologists would agree that breaking up the stones into particles less than one millimeter constitutes dusting. For this, you want to paint the stone from the outside in using low energy and high frequency. The long pulse width will allow less retropulsion during the procedure. And dusting does require a high power laser. Um, and the Holmium P120 can go up to frequencies of 120 Hertz with the Moses 2.0. Um, dusting should only be used in the kidney. I would not dust in the ureter because of the high power that um, dusting requires. Um, and one, one example also is that if you have a frequency of 80 Hertz, um, if you miss the stone for, and it takes one second to release the foot pedal, that's 80 pulses that you're releasing. So if you're in the ureter, that's 80 pulses that hit the ureter versus if you're on a fragmentation setting, that's only eight pulses hitting the ureter. Um, so all of these settings are based on the P120 Holmium Laser with Moses technology. So let's talk about that last bit a little more. Oops, I missed the popcorning. So, and then the last setting that I forgot to talk about is popcorning. So this is um, where you sit at the center of the calyx and you're using moderate energy and moderate frequency um, and kind of letting the stone fragments come to you so that they'll break up. Um, these are my popcorning settings. Um, and then you can kind of see the range there of uh, what you can use. So talking about MOSES technology, um, as a reminder, the MOSES setting is when you shoot two pulses in short succession. Uh, the first pulse vaporizes the water and the second pulse strikes the stone unobstructed, um, delivering the most energy to the stone. The theoretical benefits include reduced retropulsion um, and better stone ablation with shorter time to fragmentation. So does it make a difference? Ibrahim and all performed a randomized trial comparing regular mode to Moses mode in 72 patients and found a small difference in fragmentation time and procedural time uh, favoring Moses mode. They did not find a difference in other lasering parameters, including lasing time and total energy used. However, we performed a um, a study of 176 consecutive patients who underwent uteroscopy with the high power laser with and without Moses and found no statistical difference between the two in terms of procedural time or other significant lasing parameters. So overall, we still use the Moses technology as it may have some small benefits, but these differences are not large. Um, I would not promise my patient a shorter operative time based on the results of this real world data. 
So to talk a little bit more about holmium versus thulium. While there are over 30 years of data in the holmium laser for ureteroscopy, thulium has only emerged in the market over the past couple of years. While it's a promising new tool at our disposal, I think there's still a lot to learn about how to efficiently and safely use the thulium laser. Um, one difference that has clinical implications is the technique to use with the thulium laser. It's really a dusting laser. And as you can see here, um, you can really push the frequency settings for the thulium. High frequency is required for dusting. And while the, with the thulium, you can reach frequencies of 2,400 versus the 120 hertz for the holmium laser. So which one is better? Um, that's a loaded question because I think we still have a lot to learn about the thulium laser. We performed a randomized trial here at University of Wisconsin comparing Moses and thulium and found no difference in ureteroscope time between the two. Um, there were also similar complication rates and stone-free rates. So at this time, I do not think one laser is superior to the other. But this being said, I think there's a lot to learn about the thulium fiber laser still, including what are the optimal settings for the laser and what is the safety profile for thulium versus holmium. All right, so one big caveat, as I mentioned, is that the thulium is newer. There are a wide variety of settings that people use. Um, in this study, Dr. Traxer's group did a Twitter poll of the thulium settings that you're all just use. One takeaway is that there does not seem to be um, a consensus on what the best settings are. Um, energy settings were between 0 0.05 and 5 joules. And you can see this. Frequencies between 20 and 400 for their kind of dusting settings. So as time goes on, um, hopefully we will better understand how to get the most out of the thulium fiber laser. All right, so up to this point, we've mostly focused on the good things that lasers do. Now I'm gonna focus on the other end of the spectrum, the harms that the laser can do. There are two main ways the laser can damage the ureter or kidney. First, by direct accidental shot of the laser into the urethelium. And second, over time, the laser heats up the fluid in the collecting system and can cause indirect thermal damage to the urethelium. So this is an example of a kid or a pig kidney um, that had indirect thermal damage from three minutes of lasering at um, a high power setting. So you can see the damage to the urethelium itself and then also the damage to the parenchyma around it. Um, So thermal damage to, with, from the high-powered lasers is a real concern that is not well understood at this point. Um, other, there is a lot of interest in this space, and there are a lot of new studies coming out looking at it. Here is some data from our study. We did an in vitro study measuring the effect of holmium and thulium laser on fluid temperatures and PVC tubing um, as a way of measuring indirect thermal damage. As you can see, multiple settings um, caused increased temperature concerning for tissue damage. The thulium laser produced higher temperatures at comparable settings, and the fine dusting setting of 0.1 and 600 hertz, which you can only get with the thulium uh, laser, uh, produced a temperature up to 157 degrees Fahrenheit, almost 50 degrees above the threshold for thermal damage. So we know that this is definitely um, can cause damage to the urethelium. And then what is not understood is whether this translates into long-term pathology for the kidney. Um, this is also from our study and is a graph of the temperature over time with the two different lasers in our experiment. 
There are a lot of factors that play into the temperature variation, including the laser settings and irrigation frequency. However, a couple of the major takeaways are that the temperature rises quickly within a few minutes, um, and the maximum temperatures tended to be higher with the thulium laser. So while we are still learning more about the long-term effects of the laser on the kidney and ureter, here are a few points to remember when performing ureteroscopy with laser lithotripsy. It's important to use low settings in the ureter, um, and the, the kidney can tolerate higher settings than the ureter, but I usually still try to stay at below 25 watts while in the ureter, or in the kidney. You should use room temperature fluids as irrigation. The laser is going to heat up the fluids very quickly, and um, the patient's not going to get cold from not using warmed fluids. And also use adequate irrigation. This can help cool down the fluids around the laser. So I hope I've imparted some practical wisdom for everyone today. We've discussed the different laser modes and sources, and some of the emerging clinical data and how to best use them. We've talked about some of the different tactics for attacking stones, namely fragmentation, dusting, and popcorning. And we've talked about some of the safety concerns with lasers and why we need ongoing research to better understand the potential harms of these very effective tools. I think this is a really exciting time in the stone field. There's a lot to learn and discover. Whether you're an old master like Yoda or a baby Yoda just getting into the field. Thanks. Good, I'll show it. Any questions? Thank you, Margaret. Uh, questions, comments for Dr. Knadler? Dr. Best. Thank you. That was an excellent review. Um, I uh, just attended the talents meeting in Rome and my assigned debate topic was actually on high power versus low power holmium laser settings. Um, and it actually the, the initial assigned topic was high power versus low power. Yes, there is no difference. And I thought it was something like, yes, we have no bananas. But once I figured out that Dr. Troxair had papers on this and that sort of thing, um, it helped me to delve into the topic. And what I had been 100% um, you know, convinced that the thulium uh, and holmium when set at the super high frequencies and very low power um, really wins the day for dusting, which of course is a big deal for us here because we all tend to do a lot more dusting than um, the goal of fragmenting for complete extraction. Um, and what I, you know, delving into it, Kershaw Ghani uh, at Michigan has done a lot of really interesting research on lasers. Um, and they found that the effect of, so that the laser's ability to fragment stone goes away after 15 pulses because it has to be so close to the stone surface. So if you hold it in place, it's going to create a crater and then that crater size is so m enough that after 15 pulses it's no longer close enough to be able to continue dusting which if you have it set at 40 hertz that's it that happens in like 0.37 seconds or something like that and if you have it set at 20 seconds it's twice that so either way, less than a second before you have to be moving the laser away from there uh, in order to take advantage of the increased uh, overall total watts that you're applying. Um, and I, I know how fast many of you are, um, and I know how fast I am, and I'm not sure I can have the reaction time to move the laser enough. So it actually, I thought that was really thought provoking that, you know, it isn't perhaps as devastating as I thought if I end up being the one with the lower power laser um, that day, because if you can set it at, you know, 20 
hertz, even if that's the max setting, uh, and a you know 0.4 or 0.5 and 20 in the kidney. Again, I wouldn't do that in the ureter. Um, the results actually were apparently pretty darn similar for dusting and ablation of stones, which. I just thought it was interesting because I also found that in the, you know, we're really blessed here at UW, of course, that we have all of the technology uh, essentially available to us, which is awesome. But about half the urologists in the world only have access to low power lasers, and that's if they have them at all. So um, anyways, I thought it was an interesting physics thing and cool work that Christian is doing. Thank you. Is this on? Oh, good. Yeah, so I'll be brief. Uh, excellent lecture. Thank you. Um, I think where where we we fail here in endourology is, uh, you know, I, I I think so. For instance, our paper, which is coming out soon, uh, there are three editorial comments. So the one thing I learned is uh, there's a good reason now to review a paper because since there's a struggle to get people to review papers, if you click the box saying you, you'd like to make an editorial comment, they'll take it. So actually three people commented on our paper. And, and my concern when there's two or three editorial comments is that people just read the comments and not our paper. So of course we have to do a reply. But, but what am I getting at? I think uh, all the domains of urology you know, and I'll say something nice about the oncologist. Um, you know, I, I think the goal in discovery is to to get it right and do your best to to metric and measure the potential different treatments. And I think uh, subgroups like you know SWAG and the NIH, you know, do a pretty good job at at true RCTs and you know, identifying what are measurable and important differences in different treatments. And, and I certainly think um, it's easier in cancer, obviously, to compare, you know, uh, morbidity and mortality than it is in stone disease, because this is not as typically a lethal phenomenon. You have stone free rates and other things, but, but I fear that, you know, the, the issue here is, you know, Olivia Traxer, he was the first person to use the thulium laser. He flew to Russia uh, when it was safe to fly to Russia without air cover and uh, used the, the device to do large stones for, for dusting. And, you know, and I, I'm not debating any of his his credibility, but, but I think my point is uh, the tendency is to be driven a little more by industry than, than I think, you know, the purist would like. Now, I, I have no conflicts now because of my uh, event, ultimate work with AUA. Uh, but, but our goal anytime we set up an RCT is to see if there's a real tangible difference. And uh, we didn't find one, although we did find an efficiency difference in terms of uh, fragmentation and energy used actually favoring the, the holmium. Uh, but the editorial comments are kind of a a statement from different individuals why one laser is better than the other. So, so it's sort of opinion almost. So I, I worry, uh, and I think Sarah Best said it very well. I mean, I think number one, you know, the goal is not to have all the toys, right? And and we happen to have them. So our job is to give advice. You know, it's 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 as simple as that. Like I don't state it's a science. I just state, it, you know, it's it's a study, and I think you know, justifiable criticisms of the paper certainly exist, and you can read the comments, but I think ultimately we didn't find a real big difference. So I think whatever, you know, whatever you have is is probably acceptable. You need to just learn it as, as Margaret states. And um, we did do a trial that showed the variable pulse laser is better than, you know, a fixed pulse laser, which is, you know, the reality for of many practices today. So people are using low power fixed lasers and they can break up stones. It's just not going to be as efficient as us. And uh, so at any rate, I, I won't make it a sermon, but, but I think, you know, when all of you read the literature, you know, I think the goal, you know, is what, what is applicable in, in clinical practice. And when we set up studies, you know, the goal is 
to have a hypothesis and prove or disprove it. And, and I think, um, you know, I think different domains of urology do it differently. And, and I think a good part of journal club is to, and reading the journals is to understand that, you know, in different fields, it, it's variable what you're measuring. And then ultimately the variable domains learn from each other, right? So eventually oncologists began to understand uh, a little bit more about, you know, return to work as opposed to cancer free, just like robotic surgeons have learned more about, about margin positivity than, you know, about which suture gives you the, the fastest anastomosis, you know, and, and over my career, I've seen that this cross pollination is important. So I, I think the value here is that we see all of the different domains and what they study and why. And, um, and you can learn and I, and I think uh, here you know, this field, the, the one I'm in certainly is learning, but, but it still remains challenged, you know, because it still is a marketplace in terms of the different technologies. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, I'm oh, sorry, it's Dr. The, Richards. The microphone's leaking something, some sort of substance. But uh, anyways, speaking of the cross-pollination though, Margaret, maybe you could comment on this. Since this was focused mostly on using these lasers to, to treat stones. But uh, as an oncologist, we like to use lasers to treat tumors. Mm -hmm. um, as endourologists, you, you know, there's other uses for treating bladder stones and B BPH with, you know, thulip and holep and all that and, and these are i think as dr nakata alluded to expensive lasers uh, the cost seems to have gone up with these higher powered lasers so um can you comment on is there is one better better than the other when it when it comes to sort of tumor ablation or or prostate ablative procedures yeah that's a great question i wish i had left my slide in here so i could show you but um there, so I don't do a lot of upper tract tumors, but um, the thulium fiber is actually really good at hemostasis. Um, so um, I think it is a really good laser for upper tract tumors. Um, I've used it also for ureter seals, and um, I will tell you just from doing that that I didn't have to get any hemostasis afterwards. Um, kind of the the incision and hemostasis were all kind of at the same time. So um, I'll say that a lot of people have found that um, your visibility is a lot better when using the thulium for, um, for upper tract tumors, um, just because of the hemostatic properties. And the pulse width, which I showed earlier, um, you can have a lot longer pulse width with the thulium and that can help with hemostasis as well. Um, and um, as far as like a thule up versus a hole up for a nucleation of the prostate, there was a randomized trial um, out of Europe that showed that they had equal efficacy. Um, it did show slightly less blood loss with the thule up than the hole up. Um, that was measured based on hemoglobin levels and post-op day one. So, you know, it's a not a, a great measure of blood loss, but there isn't a great way to measure um, blood loss after that type of procedure. Um, anecdotally, I will also say that um, a thulep, the, the technical aspects of doing thulep versus holep, um, the thulium laser, because it's so good at hemostasis, it also, um, chars the tissue and so you don't see the tissue planes as well so i think that adds a, another level of um, te technical difficulty when doing a thule up versus a hole up so so i like it for upper tract tumors um, i think i would still stick with hole up versus thule up so Margaret, thank you. I, I have a comment and a question. Uh, comment is, uh, thanks for presenting the data about the heat and the thermal injury. I, I think that was a really nice uh, nuance that uh, for someone who doesn't do tons of stones uh, is important to, to be aware of. Um, 
you know, when, uh, when, when someone's irrigating and during a stone procedure, you know, sort of, we want to be able to see what we're doing, but I think that's really interesting information about the difference between the, the heat of the two lasers. And perhaps that gets into the hemostatic ability, uh, differences between the two lasers, but, uh, certainly having good irrigation. I think that really helps to emphasize that. So, uh, so thank you for presenting that information about the heat differences in the thermal. Uh, my question is about the actual uh, laser fibers themselves and what the few times I'm breaking out one of these lasers for a stone uh, on call, um, I sometimes see which where the tip of the laser fiber starts to degrade um, over time. Are there nuances or differences or discussion in the endourology world about the sort of the, the durability of the fiber tips about thulium versus holmium? Um, so actually you're kind of using the same, like the, the fiber, can, you can use the same fiber for both. Um, like the, the actual like fiber that you take out of the packaging um, is kind of the same material, whether you're using holmium versus thulium. Um, higher frequencies um, and high power will definitely degrade it faster. Um, I don't know if there probably is, but I don't know if there's data between holmium versus thulium versus which one kind of degrades faster than the other. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that Kind of the lower limit for the laser size for holmium is 200 microns. Um, thulium, you can go down to 150 and theoretically down to 50 microns, although those lasers aren't in um, clinical use because they are very delicate and can break very easily. Um, and so the, you know, the smaller lasers are, are more delicate, but then also allow kind of for a better flexibility with the flexible scope and then also better kind of irrigation. Um, so. so it's just to add to that the so in uh, Olivier Trexer, who Steve mentioned um, at, in Europe, a lot of people cut deliberately before they start the procedure, cut the tip off of the holmium laser fiber, which seems crazy, but uh, again, and you can take it with a grain of salt, but uh, Olivier has done, uh, Traxair has done studies that swears that that's more uh, efficient and effective for lasering. So while I'm not sure that that has been true in my practice, at least I think it means that while it seems annoying because you have to keep adjusting and moving the fiber forward and it's kind of annoying if the cladding, you burn back to the, the cladding, the laser st should still be as efficacious even if it's burning back. Yeah, truthfully, the uh, I think what the companies don't want you to know is you could probably use the same laser fiber over and over again. And I think Olivier and uh, a fellow named Joel Teichman from Canada, you know, kind of both champion the same approach at the same time, that that the emission might actually be more efficient without the tip. So, you know, you know, for us, it becomes this, you know, an FDA safety matter uh, in, in terms of that, so. I see, yeah. Right, and it's just like the uh, robotic arm, right? You can only use it once. You get a certain amount of time, and then yeah, clocks you need another easy. token. Yeah, it's another like an NFC back. chip or something, right? To, to keep the car parked, you have to put it in, put money in the meter. Um, really quickly, uh, it's uh, another point that I was going to make on top of the cut in the laser, fi uh, the laser fiber tip. Sometimes our aiming beam goes down. And then we can't see the clear part. And so I think part of the reason why Traxer does what he does is because it allows him to stay, see the fiber at all times, no matter how much dust comes around and all those other kinds of things. Um, and I just wanted to tie all this back for like resident education, resident participation, and um, whoever's listening. Um, by a show of hands, how many residents actually choose or care between fiber types and actually choose their settings? You don't have to answer out loud, just show of hands. Totally cool if it's no. Maybe that's what it is. Um, one of the first things that Dr. Nakata told me when I started my fellowship was um, the average urologist, almost everybody can do 95% of cases. What makes somebody special is those last 5% of the difficult cases. And this is a key piece of those 5% of difficult cases, is knowing what your settings are, knowing what your laser is, and knowing your tools in detail. Um, so I would highly recommend, I know that it's, it's tough to, to, to retain this level of detail when you're still working hard as a resident, 
But I think in the long term, every time you get in the operating room, if you can try to incorporate some of these theories, some of these uh, tidbits of knowledge, I think it'd make you guys that much better operators and surgeons. So um, that was it. Thanks. And, and I think what uh, Dr. Antar was referring to, to, to use a, um, a discussion oftentimes of Dr. Nakata states is from uh, checkers to chess. And uh, needless to say that this department is playing chess in the, uh, in the endourology world. So um, for the further comments from the group or from the audience uh, who are attending virtually, I didn't see any hands or anything coming through the chat, D. Okay. Well, without uh, further ado, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Knadler, for the presentation. Uh, we'll take a minute or two to transition over to the Unknown Conference. Thanks, everybody.